for joining us here today in this cold case homicide press conference that we wanted to get back out to the community. Just a few days ago, we did a press release in terms of publishing it online, but it's important to go through the details here, um, not only for closure for the agency, but closure for the community and closure to the families who lost a loved one. You know, we're going back now since 2019, where this administration created a cold case unit. We had recognized that we had about 300 different cold cases expanding almost 25, 30 years at times, and victims were not getting any form of justice. And so we developed this unit, and since then, this is now case 21, of which we've been able to solve, whether it been a homicide or a rapist who was out in our community creating harm, and we're delighted that we can expand that number to 21, uh, as I said. So this really wraps up a case that took place back in 1998, where at the time a Jane Doe, no one knew her name, was brutally sexually assaulted and murdered and left to rot in the woods. Fortunately, through advancements in forensic science, DNA awareness, investigative practices, we've been able to close this case out and identify a suspect, a suspect who is currently in custody and in custody for the murder of another woman only two weeks before this discovery of this case in 1998. And that suspect is Lucius Boyd. He's currently seated on death row for those murders. And through the collection of DNA evidence and investigating and looking at all the different variables from other cases, it allowed our detectives up here today to be able to close this case out. Um, with me to my right is Detective Zach Scott and Captain John Brown and the homicide units who have been spearheading this effort. Uh, but it truly has been a collective effort amongst our cold case unit, crime scene, crime lab, and even our partners at FDLE ha who have participated in this. So yes, for 20-something years, there has been no closure, no justice for who is now identified as Eileen Trumpner. That was our victim. She is no longer faceless. She is no longer nameless. And that's important for us as a community to have that name. And it's important for the family members who are actually here today. I can't express how important it is for us as an organization to continue to focus on these cold cases and to continue to expand this unit because there's proof and concept. We have been tremendously successful, and as I've said before to this community, justice has no expiration date. And if you commit a crime, a brutal murder or a rape, whether it been 20 years ago or tomorrow, we're going to track you down and bring you into custody. I can go over in detail some of the highlights of how this case occurred. Uh, what I would like to do is pivot to uh, Q&A for you all. I have uh, Detective Zach Scott who will be able to answer more specific questions as we dive into the elaborate nature and how they were able to solve this case. Uh, but with that, I will roll over. Marissa, you want to start us out? Sure. Well, yeah, absolutely. So early on, as I talked about, this case is almost 20 plus years old. And you look back how the case was uh, originally discovered and the detective's ability uh, to try to have follow ups was really zero. At the time, uh, the victim was identified as a Jane Doe. No one knew who she was. Uh, in addition to that, at the time, the type of marketing effort, so to speak, to the media to get information. Um, identifying descriptions of her clothes, those type of things took place, but it yielded almost basically no results. And when we launched this homicide uh, cold case unit back in 2019, one of the cases that we were working in 2021 was related to a serial killer out in the community who was raping and brutalizing women and then stuffing them in duffel bags, et cetera. Well, that case had allowed us to work more DNA evidence that linked these two cases together. Uh, and I'll let uh, Detective Scott talk a little bit more about that. But in essence, had we not started this cold case unit and investigated previous cases, we would have never got to resolution on this case, which speaks to how important it is to be thorough in our analysis of all these different cases. I think I talked before uh, when we were dealing with the pillowcase rapists, as we called them, uh, with our detectives and staff, that they went back and looked at thousands and thousands of boxes and case uh, management files to kind of eliminate, process of elimination, getting rid of suspects, and then adding them on. So a great effort. Zach, is there anything else you wish to add on to that in terms of processing? Sure. Um, as the sheriff mentioned, uh, this case in, in 98 originally, 
it ended or it, it kind of got put on pause because we had exhausted the forensic science available to us at the time. Um, it's very hard to work a homicide when you don't know who your victim is. Mm -hmm. So our goal, when we were originally looking at the uh, other serial killer case that Sheriff Tony mentioned, um, Roberto Fernandez, and we were looking at similar cases that were still open, this case got our attention. We needed to ID this victim. Um, now, knowing that we have advances in forensic science and with the advent of genealogy, uh, we reprocessed the evidence to try to get the material we needed to identify the victim. And in the course of doing that processing, we were able to link uh, Lucius Boyd to her murder uh, through that physical evidence. So it, it really is just very fortunate that we were able to take advantage of the science that we have now. Uh, FDLE uh, assisted us with doing the genealogy um, and, and that component, which is, is new emerging technology that's going to give us a lot more results on these type of cases. Yes, sir. Did you question Lucius Boyd? Did he say, did you say, you know, sure. did you do it? Sure. Um, I did meet with Mr. Boyd, uh, where he's currently incarcerated. He did not wish to discuss the case with me. How did you identify her? Uh, through genealogy, uh, they were able to um, narrow it down to uh, certain members of, of a family, and then it's just shoe leather. You go out, you meet with people, you talk about relatives, and uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, meet Eileen's family, and uh, then we were able to confirm her identity by taking familial swabs and doing a comparison. Yes. How many police here talked before more than these two women's deaths? Could you give a little bit of other suspected cases? Sure. Um, I, I will say that Mr. Boyd is a suspect in several other homicides. Um, not all of them are necessarily here in Broward County. Uh, we are currently pursuing those cases and working with other agencies to uh, further investigate those. Is there anything that's been similar between all those cases? I mean, is it all, all the different similar or, you know? What I, what I would say as far as the similarities is that there is um, a common thread in the victims as far as that they were uh, women um, and they were in vulnerable situations that I believe Mr. Boyd took advantage of. Sure. Sure. Um, Joanne, if you don't mind, we have a family member here, and considering we are in the investigative capacity, no one can speak better about this individual than Eileen, than perhaps her sister Nancy, who's here today. Hello, my name is Nancy, and I'm Eileen's sister. Um, my sister was very kind. The good heart, she was never criticized anybody, and she no hurt anybody. And she's going quiet at the time. When she know the person, she was going. Then she, she, she was a good person. And not only that, she was a professional. She worked in Puerto Rico. Uh, she was the one charge of the taxes in Puerto Rico. So she had her job. So she came to Miami to take classes to speak English. And that's when the things um, change, a lot change. She has children. She went under depression, postpartum depression. She had two children and he, he, she, was, she gets sick. So she lost custody and from there, from there everything started. And like I say, she was a good person. She knew the self the die the way she died, brutalized, killed, sexually, and she knew the server. And even though they have the person in in in, in jail, and that person gonna have to, gonna get justice, and that's why we want justice for Eileen. And another thing that I have to mention: thank you, thank you for the. Rowley Sheriff Department for the Detective Scott. When the first time I meet him, he said, Nancy, 24 years ago, when I enrolled the department, Detective Department, Eileen was my first case. And he never gave up in Eileen. He was, he was persistent in finding her killer until he did. And I appreciate this is a good team, Broward community 
you have the best team in here, and they're persistent, and they're not going to give up in anybody. And that's what I'm so appreciative of the work in here, everybody. They do the best until finally they have him. And Jim, let me tell you, even though I said a while ago, this happened a while ago, the wound is open. It, it hurts. And it hurts like it was yesterday. You know, never in my mind was planning to receive a notice like this. Violin with her when she was kind, she was Christian. And the way that she died, and she not deserved that, but thank you to the Broward Sheriff Department, brought justice and brought a name. And thank you, everybody, for yes, your support. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Sí, de la recibí por teléfono. El sheriff uh, Scott me llamó and <coughs> se identificó. Yo también me identifiqué. Yo dije, yo era Nancy. Y él me preguntó que quién, que si yo tenía una hermana que se llamaba Eileen, le dije que sí. Yo lo primero que dije, you found her. Because never in my mind occurred to me that she died the way she died. And I thought she was going out, going in battle. She didn't want to be found. Because what happened, we have lost. And, and when he started talking and explaining, he was, cuando él empezó a hablar y a decirme the way that she, la manera de que ella murió, I, I just, my heart sang. And my, mi corazón está quebrado desde entonces. Como les dije, fue hace muchos años atrás, pero la herida está presente. No ha cerrado la herida. Y cada día vivimos con esperanza de que va a ser mejor. Ahora que tiene a este individuo tan serial killer, va a ser mejor para otras mujeres que están allá afuera. Sabrá Dios esperar a una persona como esta esperando. So, gracias de nuevo a Browry Sheriff Department, the detective, por haber hecho el trabajo tan grande que hicieron de 24, 25 años, no perder la esperanza de coger el asesino. Thank you, Sheriff. Yes, ma'am. Gracias. Thank, Thank you all for the questions and allowing Nancy to speak. Uh, any other follow-up questions for us? Yes, ma'am. It's, it's the best part of the job. Um, you know, when you become the sheriff in any capacity and have administrative controls over what's created, what you invest in, uh, what units are pivotally, like, important for the community. Um, I remember sitting with Colonel John Hell, who's the executive director over professional standards and investigations, um, and him talking about the dire need of this back in 2019. And it made all the sense in the world to me. Uh, and then the cases start coming in. This is case 21, all right? This is our 21st case that's been solved uh, from that unit. And it never gets old. It's a reminder um, that we can't stop, that boxes sitting in closets um, are not boxes. They're people, they're memories, they're, they're dreams, they're passions. They're, they're all these things that we'll, we'll never see again. So I love what these guys are doing. They're, they're doing a great job. Yeah, you know, I'll let Captain uh, Brown talk about it. It's in his unit, but um, just off on the surface side, I know we have gone through hundreds of cases and looking at those that give a greater probability of solving, but none of those cases that I mentioned, um, I think it was 300 at the time, is that right, John, that we had? None of those are sitting idly by where we're not doing anything with them. Um, so, but Captain, please just expand a little bit more on what your, your shop is doing. So we evaluate all the cases, like he said, between 300 and 350. Uh, we triage them for evidentiary value, things that we can work on immediately and get the ball rolling because we're on the clock. A lot of the witnesses uh, pass away, a lot of witnesses we can't find. So we literally look at every single case to make sure, is this something we can move on quickly? Uh, I tend to give my guys five cases each and they shuffle through it. Um, we don't want to overburden them because sometimes it gets, it gets kind of tough to case manage, but um, that's basically where we're at. But anytime a tip comes in, a lead comes in, it becomes priority. Uh, we immediately look at it because we don't want anything to deteriorate. 
uh, and we go from there. Um, we, all the municipalities that we've taken over, we've gone back and opened up those cases and looked at them all for investigative leads. Um, we're, we're using ge uh, genealogy through FDLE. It's a great opportunity for us. Um, DNA is a big part of it. Uh, as we move closer, uh, cell phone technology is becoming a big thing that we're using. Um, other than that, uh, so back to this suspect. He traveled the state, the entire state of Florida. So we had to broaden anybody out there. We need to get the word out. If anybody had any contact with him going back in the late 90s, from 95 to 99, please bring forward the tips. He's on death row. Right? He's on death row. And how many murders have been? Two. So he was on two murders. No, one, and then the one that we just charged him with. Um, and there's suspected several others. So. So he's officially charged in this case. Yes, he went to grand jury a few days ago. And it, it's true, Bill. So. Is he considered a serial killer? Yeah. Well, F FBI standards, three or more. However, because we suspect him for other ones, we, we strongly believe he's a serial killer. I would just say situations where he may uh, prey upon their lack, lack of resources or uh, if they're in a vulnerable situation. The case he's currently on death row for, yes, oh, sorry. Sure, uh, the case he's currently on death row for, uh, Donia DaCosta, um, she had run out of gas and had walked to a gas station and he had offered her a ride back to her vehicle. Um, he, he's, he's a predator. And he uh, he sees his opportunities. So that when I say vulnerable, I just mean there are situations where you know he realizes that um, he could take advantage of it. Can you reconstruct how Eileen happened across his path? We don't know, uh, 100 percent, because unfortunately those two would be the only ones who would know. Um, we do know, as Nancy spoke about, that she had mental health struggles, um, and I do believe that he probably recognized that and took advantage of it. Yeah, I think with the, just to add on to that, it, keep in mind, for, especially for those who've been here for many of these different press conferences that we had related to serial killers or murderers or, or rapists, uh, there's a consistent pattern in who they target as victims. They, they look for the vulnerable, they look for the ones who are suffering from mental illness, someone who's on substance abuse, people who are in their hardships, down and out, who don't have immediate connectivity with their family members, so that when they do go missing, it's not um, abnormal. Family members haven't talked to him for years in some cases. So I would imagine as we continue to investigate these cases and we have new um, solved cold cases, you'll see a familiar pattern. All right. So excellent. Thank you all for joining us today.